The images we're getting tonight out of Ukraine are frankly some of the most unsettling we've seen yet. No wonder the U.S. and Europe are under growing pressure to do more in ending this war. Bucha is a town just northwest of Kyiv. Russian soldiers took it over soon after invading Ukraine. They have since retreated, but the mayor of Bucha says those soldiers left behind the bodies of more than 300 residents. Their bodies had apparently been lying in the streets for weeks. Some victims seem to have been shot in the back of the head with their hands tied, presumably killed by Russian soldiers. Human rights monitors from the UN say they want immediate access to Bucha to investigate these claims. Moments ago, we found out that Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky will address the UN Security Council tomorrow about these killings. Meanwhile, today, he toured the city and accused Russia of genocide. Now, President Biden is declining to call this genocide per se, at least for now. But he and French President Emmanuel Macron agreed that these images are clear signs of war crimes. Today, Mr. Biden called for Vladimir Putin to face a war crime trial. We'll have more on that in a moment. The president also called for even tougher sanctions against Russia, though he did not yet specify what they would be. Meanwhile, Russia is denying having any role in the killing of the civilians in Bucha. It is also claiming that all of this is fake and that Ukrainian forces staged it. NBC's Ali Aruzi joins us tonight from Lviv, Ukraine. Ali, what else are people saying about what happened in Bucha? Well, it's, it's a scene of horror and devastation in Bucha. People you speak to here in Ukraine, ordinary civilians are shocked. There is a deep, deep sorrow at what's happened there. But they're not entirely surprised. You know, they say that the Russians are capable of this. We've seen them bomb churches, uh, children's hospitals, apartment buildings. Uh, and this was kind of expected from them. Uh, so it is a devastating scene. But the Russians have now moved back from there and, uh, and what, what, what's happened happened there is just horrifying. The mayor of Bucha gave a, such a chilling account of what he'd seen just as soon as that city had opened up. He said at least 20 people had been uh, executed with a bullet to the back of the head, some of them with their hands tied behind their backs. And as you've seen, Zelensky is calling this not only a war crime, but genocide. He's going to address the Security Council tomorrow uh, to push that case forward to say how horrifying this is. Uh, he he says that people have been slaughtered in the city of Bucha, uh, and those scars are going to remain on the people that have survived there for a very long time. We heard one terrible account of a woman whose husband had been uh, separated from her by the Russian troops in Bucha. Uh, once the Russian troops had left, she'd been led to a, a basement. He had been mutilated. His face had been blown off. They had to bury him in a shallow grave about a meter deep, and they said it was a meter deep, so stray dogs didn't eat his body. I understand that, as we mentioned, Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, is going to speak tomorrow at the UN Security Council meeting. I, I wonder how this factors into this. I mean, he said that it would be hard to continue with the peace talks with what we've just seen. But of course, without peace talks, the worse this is going to get. He has said that sanctions from the West would not be enough after what happened in Bucha. So what is the thought process in terms of what the international community does now? Well, look, these peace talks are going to be very difficult. The, the, the Ukrainians are saying that they are going to press ahead with these peace talks uh, because they want to bring this war to an end as fast as possible and change Vladimir Putin's mind. But at the same time, they say that they are going to fight on the ground against the Russians. But let's not kid ourselves here. Uh, these peace talks haven't made much traction. Over the weekend, uh, the Ukrainians said that the Russians had agreed to a draft treaty and there was enough there for the two of them to 
meet. Only two days later, the Russians said, you know what, actually, there isn't enough in that treaty for the two uh, leaders of Ukraine and Russia to meet. So it's going to be very difficult. And of course, it's going to be even more complicated uh, if President Biden, quite correctly, too, is calling for a war crimes tribunal against Putin. So there is a long way to go. They haven't even met. And even if they met each other, it's going to be an extraordinarily complicated process. But the international community, the UN, are all launching independent reports uh, and investigations into what happened in Bucha and in other places in this country. So there's a still a lot of uh, a lot of work to be done and a lot of investigation to be done. And one of the human rights councils in the UN said that it's imperative uh, that evidence is preserved in these places so strong cases can be brought forward. Yeah, some of the evidence I'm sure will just be the accounts of the people who were there or who understand what happened there. I know you spoke to a few people about what happened in Bucha. Here is some of what they said. Those people were just walking and they shot them without any reason. Bang. The shooter shouted, don't scream or I will shoot. And they turned away. Then they shot off his left leg completely. Then they shot him all over the chest. And another shot went slightly below the temple. It was a controlled shot to the head. When I came down, I recognized him by his shoes, his trousers. His face was mutilated, his body was cold. They turned him over a little. My neighbor still has a picture of his face. He had been shot in the head, mutilated, tortured. So we've got these very intense accounts, Ali, of what happened in Bucha. With regard to the path forward, it sounds like it continues getting more and more complicated as time goes on. I mean, just recall that there were peace talks in Budapest not too long ago. Hungary's leader, Viktor Orban, just got reelected. And despite being uh, in NATO and the EU, he has a very close relationship, a geopolitical relationship, with Vladimir Putin. So how does all of this kind of wash out in the end, considering that you have some previous alliances there that have to be reckoned with? Well, that, that, that's exactly right. You know, they have a border here. Look, a lot of refugees from uh, Ukraine have gone to Hungary, but Hungary is saying that they're not going to let any armament, any sort of armament or aid into Ukraine because they are very strongly aligned with Russia. And of course, the rest of the alliance is giving Ukraine uh, aid and armament, but they're not getting what they want, Joshua. I mean, uh, Zelensky has said time and time again that they need those MiGs to fight the Russians in the air. They need those air defensive systems to shoot down those missiles that are destroying the cities uh, across Ukraine. Uh, they need much more. They need tanks to fight them on the land. And they're not getting these things. And that's why Zelensky is saying cities like Mariupol have been flattened because they don't have that sophisticated hardware to fight the Russians. And yet they're saying, look, we're still pushing them that, pushing them back. Think what we could do if we had that sophisticated hardware. Thank you, Ali. Much appreciated. That's NBC's Ali Arouzi starting us off tonight from Lviv. Now, the leaders of democratic nations are reaching a growing consensus that Russian forces are committing war crimes in Ukraine. Well, our partners at Sky News looked into widespread attacks on civilians as well as reports of mass graves. As you might expect, their report contains images that you might find hard to watch. International Affairs editor Dominic Waghorn has the story. In retreats, Russian forces have revealed a grisly trail of evidence of war crimes. The world's response has been swift and unanimous. This guy is brutal, and what's happening in Bucha is outrageous, and everyone's seen it. I think it is a war crime. We will not rest until these criminals have been brought to justice. It's clear that there is clear evidence of war crimes. It was the Russian army that was in butcher. International justice must prevail. Across Ukraine, Russians have been accused of targeting civilians and their property. A clear war crime, but other atrocities too. In Bucha, there's at least one mass grave with civilian bodies. Elsewhere, civilians have been tied up and executed. Across the Kyiv region, say Human Rights Watch, there were multiple rapes, summary executions, the murder of women and children and looting. There's been systematic and deliberate destruction of civilian property. Authorities in Chernihiv say 70% of the city has been destroyed. 
Drone footage suggests that barely a building's been untouched by the bombing and shelling of Mariupol. There's no one single outrage, more a pattern of deliberate destruction of civilian infrastructure and the massacre and terrorization of hundreds, if not thousands, of civilians. Since Yugoslavia and Rwanda, international prosecutors have become better at identifying suspects and prosecuting them. Ukrainians have begun compiling evidence already to hand to prosecutors from the International Criminal Court. Ukrainian human rights experts say the list of Russian suspects will be long, from President Putin down. As the practice shows of the ICC and uh, International Criminal uh, Tribunals for Rwanda and former Yugoslavia, it doesn't matter if the person is, uh, was a president or general or uh, the person was officer, sergeant or soldier. It, it, it matters what crimes were committed. Ukraine may be a victim of war crimes, but it's also a place of authority on the laws surrounding them. In particular, two legal scholars from this city, Lviv, who practically invented the concepts of genocide and crimes against humanity in international law. Work pioneered by Ukrainian lawyers at the Nuremberg Nazi trials in the aftermath of World War II, now tragically relevant again to the people of Ukraine. Dominic Waghorn, Sky News, Lviv. Now, as we mentioned, President Biden responded to the massacre in Bucha by calling Putin a war criminal again. He is a war criminal, but we have to gather the information. We have to continue to provide Ukraine with the weapons they need to continue the fight. And we have to gather all the detail so this can be an actual have a war crime trial. This guy is brutal. And what's happening in Bucha is outrageous. French President Emmanuel Macron agreed with President Biden. As you heard in Dominic Weichhorn's report, Monsieur Macron says there was strong evidence of war crimes, as well as clear indications that Russia was responsible. Now, suppose they're both right. Suppose that Russia is committing war crimes. What happens next? Would it make stopping this war any easier? Joining us now is Michael Allen, a foreign policy expert at the National Security Institute. He served as a special assistant to President George W. Bush at the National Security Council. Mr. Allen, welcome. Thank you. What impact does it have, if any, for the presidents of France and the United States to out loud say that Vladimir Putin is committing war crimes? Does the International Criminal Court have any regard for those kinds of public statements? Does it, does it matter? I think the International Criminal Court does have regard for those types of statements. I think it's important for the free world, the civilized world, to be able to say that there is a court that you can be referred to for these types of absolutely horrible crimes. They have universal jurisdiction, so it's not as if they have to be referred to one state in particular, but any state could eventually render a war criminal to trial in The Hague or elsewhere as the United Nations may say fit. Now, how does that actually work? I mean, rendering Vladimir Putin as a criminal to anywhere outside of Russia seems like a tall order at best. I I'm just not sure how that would work since the ICC relies on the cooperation of other nations and can't just impose a judgment on a sovereign country. Well, you're right. It is difficult for us to imagine now how that type of transfer would go, but we don't know what lies in the future. And nonetheless, there is a significant deterrent effect for others in the chain of command below Vladimir Putin to be able perhaps to try and put an end to this type of activity, if indeed it is systematic and something that generals and other inferior officers have ordered their troops to do. And it's otherwise just a good measure for us to have out there that says the Ameri the, not only the American community, but the international community is watching for these types of crimes in particular, and you won't get away with them. How does a war crimes trial work? Is it kind of like what we consider a criminal trial here in the U.S. where you have a prosecution and a defense and they make opening statements and call witnesses and there's a judge and a closing and, and a jury? Is that the way it works or is it a more specialized process? It is remarkably similar to how a criminal court case would work in the United States or elsewhere in the West. I think there's a different tribunal of judges. There's not a jury 
per se. Um, the law is international law rather than a particular um, set of statutes from one country or the next, but it's, it's called the Rome Statute. It's there online, and you can read through just how similar it is in terms of an investigation, a referral, an actual trial for defendants. It's happened before, by the way, it can maybe happen again, and it's a good thing that it's out there just as a deterrent effect. What do you think of some of the rhetoric that's been used to describe what's happening, including in Bucha? President Biden and President Macron have called it war crimes. President Zelensky of Ukraine has referred to it as genocide. I think words matter. How do you see the difference in the words that they're using? I certainly think it's a war crime, and basically that means the intentional targeting of civilians. I believe that they, were, they, the Russians, were already committing such war crimes even before Bucha. I think what you heard Secretary Blinken and others, well, Jake Sullivan say today, when he spoke from the White House podium, was that he hasn't seen sort of a systematic type of effort from the Russians, and that would be an indicia of genocide, think the Nazis and the Jewish people. So I don't think they're quite to that level of genocide yet, but war crimes nonetheless are very, very serious and would get you similarly referred to the criminal court just as the other crimes would. We mentioned that President Zelensky will be speaking to the UN Security Council tomorrow. We had a question from a viewer about the power that international organizations like the UN and NATO have in all of this here is what Luke left in our inbox. Even if he is proven of war crimes in Ukraine, isn't it true that there is nothing that the United Nations or NATO or the United States could do to impose regime change in Russia because it is a nuclear arsenal and that conflict would lead to World War III? Luke, thank you for that question. Mr. Allen, what would you say to Luke? Well, your viewer's right. There is, well, first of all, it's not our policy or that of the West to have regime change in Russia as deserving as Vladimir Putin would be. But it is certainly a hefty deterrent that he has nuclear weapons, could use them as well. So it, your, your viewer is absolutely correct that it's one tall order. It is hard to enforce these types of measures, but it's important to have them out there as a deterrent where we hope somewhere down the line people will be fearful of what the international community can do for them for certain crimes that have such horrible consequences. With regard to that, just to carry that a little further forward, um, speaking to the Security Council is going to be interesting because the rotating presidency of the Security Council right now is held by Russia. Although we did hear from the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Linda Thomas-Greenfield, who spoke this evening to NPR's Michelle Martin, and said that they expect to have a vote on removing Russia from the UN Human Rights Council this week. She said possibly as early as Thursday. Michelle Martin asked what force will this have and whether this is symbolic. And Ambassador Thomas Greenfield said it's more than symbolic and does have force because it continues what we have started, and that is to isolate Russia and to call them out for what they're doing. Again, that's from NPR's interview with the U.S. ambassador to the U.N. Before I have to let you go, Mr. Allen, I'm sure that some people will hear that and think it's great that Russia is continually being verbally and vocally and visibly isolated from the world community. I'm sure that other people will say that's very cute for you, but it isn't going to stop children from being shot in the back of the head in the middle of the street. It's not going to stop anything. What is the strongest response that the world community can have? Right. Oh, it's sorry. Not- go ahead. Go ahead. It's, it's not going to stop anything. You're absolutely true. What's going to stop Russia are more sanctions and more weapons going to the Ukrainians so that over time, Vladimir Putin has to make a terrible decision for him, which is, do I further narrow my war aims and try and cut back about against what I'm doing to the Ukrainians? That ultimately is what's going to be the savior for the, for the Ukrainians, although it's a mockery of the United Nations to have the Russians and in sometimes in our, in our lifetime, the Cubans and others have been also on the Human Rights Commission. They deserve to get kicked off. It's an absolute joke. 
And I do want to note that the ambassador did not say that they would be seeking the removal from the Human Rights Council instead of more sanctions. She mentioned that that would be, that would be sought, but not necessarily to the detriment of sanctions. Michael Allen, I appreciate you giving us some context tonight, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Still to come, Russian state media has been telling a very different story than we are about the war in Ukraine. Apparently, some Russians believe there's no war at all. We'll have more on the propaganda and misinformation campaigns that are happening there. We're glad you're with us for now tonight from NBC News. More than 4 million Ukrainian civilians have already left their country, and that exodus is growing every day. Most of these refugees are heading west toward Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania. Political and military leaders are encouraging them to evacuate. Those officials are preparing for Russia's military to shift its tactics in the days to come. From Sky News, John Sparks has that story. If there is a place offering safety and security, it lies hundreds of kilometers to the west, and the people of eastern Ukraine will do their best to reach it. But the roads are congested, and the checkpoints are overwhelmed, with queues of three kilometers or more. At the train station in Kramatorsk, a long line of hopeful passengers leads out the door. And on platform number one, we witness scenes of order and pandemonium, the two in constant competition. But as the Russians move east, the people of this city are getting out. Why do you feel you have to leave? The governor of the region of Donetsk has told residents to leave. He's worried they'll get in the way of his soldiers. But it isn't easy to relocate your life. Just ask Tetiana and best friend Rocky. Do you know where you're going? Do you have a plan? There are two trains expected. Uh, one at one o'clock, one at four o'clock, both to Lviv. They may or may not arrive, we're not sure yet, but there are too many people here to fit inside those trains, and it has been like that for the last couple of days. A moment of relief arrived on a chair in the crowded booking hall. His name is Svatoslav Vakarchuk, and he offered a few words. Then a woman asked him to sing. Mr. Vakarchuk is Ukraine's most popular entertainer. When the day comes, the war will be over. Hug me, hug me, he sang. Why did you come? Why did you come here to speak to people? Because I want them to make sure, to be sure that they're not alone. So the whole country stands together with them. We have and it's some very soldiers important. here uh, who want to, 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 to greet you. you. These are the best people in the world. I'm so proud of these, of these guys. I mean, all of them are, these are heroes. The Ukrainian military will be tested in the days and weeks ahead. For the Russians have set their sights on eastern Ukraine. And after a series of failures, President Putin will expect results. We spoke to the regional governor. Have you seen evidence that the Russian military is reinforcing its positions in the east. від ворога можна очікувати після всіх їх звірячих вчинків, я по-іншому це назвати не можу, можна очікувати будь-що. The people of this region know what's coming and they've seen what's happened in communities surrounding Kyiv. This trip an act of necessity, not an act of choice. 
John Sparks, Sky News in Kramatorsk. Now, reports like that one and programs like this one are hard to come by inside Russia. The Kremlin is using the invasion as a pretext to push out independent journalism and media. A widespread misinformation campaign has many Russians apparently believing conspiracy theories. But what makes this propaganda so effective? NBC national security correspondent Ken Delanian has that story. For those watching television news in Russia, there is no war in Ukraine, only a special military operation designed to root out Nazis, and it's all going according to plan. Those pictures of bombed out cities? The Ukrainians did it to themselves, Russian state media insists. It sounds bizarre to Western ears, but experts say many, if not most, Russians believe it. It's quite terrifying, the effect that this propaganda is having on ordinary Russians. Alexei Kovalev is an award-winning Russian investigative reporter at Medusa, a Russian independent news site. He left Moscow in early March as Vladimir Putin's government cracked down on the few remaining voices of dissent. Kovalev and others familiar with the Russian media landscape say years of disinformation by state organs has left much of the Russian public in the grip of conspiracy theories. It's now a criminal offense to call it war, and Russia is just conducting this special operation to uh, liberate Ukraine uh, from the Nazis. The latest line was with, we didn't expect that the, basically the entire Ukraine is Nazis. I'm not, I'm not kidding you, I'm not exaggerating, it's, a, it's an actual quote. Since the invasion, the Kremlin has shut down independent journalism and made it almost impossible for Russians to access Facebook, Twitter, and international news sites. But even before that, most Russians were fed a diet of Lies. Michael Wajura is a fluent Russian speaker who once played the role of token American on Russian talk shows, allowed to say a few words before being shouted down by other panelists. Michael, he left Russia with his Russian wife just before the invasion. He says the Putin government's lie that Ukraine is controlled by Nazis strikes a deep chord in a Russia that lost millions of its citizens while helping to defeat Nazi Germany. So memory of the Second World War in Russia essentially exists as the justification for the current Kremlin leadership to maintain its position. The reason why Russia is great is because it won the Second World War. That gives people some sort of identification with a fight against Nazism. Not every Russian believes the propaganda. Thousands have left the country. But those who know the truth sometimes have trouble convincing even their own relatives. We've seen uh, a lot of these heartbreaking scenes in many Russian families uh, where Ukrainian relatives uh, are calling them from the other side and telling them that the Russian army is bombing their cities and killing them. Uh, uh, and the Russian part of the family simply refuses to acknowledge that, simply refuses to, uh, to believe them, saying that this, it's all fake news. And he says many Russians don't want to confront what is really happening. It's not that this disinformation is so uh, terrifyingly effective. It's actually quite lame and stupid. It's, it's self-contradictory. But it seems to provide people a convenient kind of cushion between themselves and the horrific reality that they will have to face one day, that Russia is indeed waging a war of aggression against Ukraine. With the invasion not going as Russia hoped, its citizens are not hearing that as many as 15,000 of their soldiers have died, some of their bodies left to rot on the battlefield. As for sanctions... So they're being told the same thing that they were being told before the war, which is that the Western world wants to isolate you. They're worried about... Russia becoming too strong. Wajura believes Russia is in the grip of a kind of mass psychosis. I don't understand how this can just heal itself. I don't know how this can get better without some sort of outside intervention. A triumph of disinformation with deadly consequences. That was NBC's Ken Delanian reporting. Up next, Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson appears to be on track for joining the Supreme Court. But today, something happened with her nomination that has not happened since 1853. That is just ahead. Stay close. They even suggested that Judge Jackson, a mother to two wonderful daughters, quote, endangers children. 
Judge Jackson is a better person than me. If Judge Jackson is confirmed, I believe she will prove to be the most extreme and the furthest left justice ever to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Judge Jackson has nothing to do with critical race theory, despite a number of engaging posters. Judge Jackson will coddle criminals and terrorists. She will twist and ignore the law to reach any result that she wants. That's some of what we heard from the Senate Judiciary Committee today. Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson is one step closer to the Supreme Court, despite a procedural roadblock in that committee today. The committee voted along party lines on whether to advance her nomination to a full vote of the Senate. 11 Democrats voted for, 11 Republicans voted against, and that deadlock triggered another procedural move. The Senate voted to discharge her nomination from the committee to the full body. That allows all senators to vote on her confirmation without the Judiciary Committee's recommendation. And this is the first time that has happened since 1853. Tonight, Senate Democrats and the White House secured vital support from three Republicans. Senators Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, Mitt Romney of Massachusetts, and Susan Collins of Maine voted in favor of discharging the nomination. They all say they will support Judge Jackson's confirmation. NBC senior national political reporter Sahil Kapoor joins us now. And Sahil, what does it mean that the full Senate uh, overrode this, this discharge? Well, what does that tell us about this process? Joshua, it means that Judge Ketanji Brown-Jackson is now on a glide path to be confirmed uh, by the Senate to the Supreme Court. That's likely to happen later this week. The procedural vote of 53 to 47 is just that. It's a, it's a procedural motion, but it all but certainly indicates the final outcome as we now have 53 senators who are on the record in favor of confirming Judge Jackson. She'll still have to go through uh, the regular ringer in the Senate, all these procedural votes uh, and some uh, hours of debate, 30 hours in total before a final vote is held, but as early as Thursday, potentially Friday, Judge Jackson is likely to be confirmed and become Justice Jackson after Susan Collins was joined by Republicans Mitt Romney and Lisa Murkowski, joining all 50 Democrats and becoming uh, 53 votes in total to confirm Judge Jackson. Before I get to those three Republicans who said they'd support Judge Jackson, today's committee hearing where they voted 11 to 11, deadlocked about discharging the recommendation, was there anything noteworthy out of that hearing or was it kind of the same sort of political rhetoric, the same political lines that we heard during the confirmation hearings? It was largely the same political lines, uh, the same kind of party line rhetoric that we'd heard over the confirmation hearings that happened a couple of weeks ago. But one moment stood out to me, Joshua, and that's when Senator Lindsey Graham, the Republican of South Carolina, made very clear that Judge Jackson would not get through a Republican-controlled Senate. That means, uh, according to Graham, that they would not even have held a hearing, the committee wouldn't, in his view, if uh, Mitch McConnell was the Senate Majority Leader as opposed to the Senate Minority Leader. That was a remarkable indication of just how partisan and politicized this process has gotten that uh, Graham is saying outwardly that a Republican-controlled Senate wouldn't even allow consideration of uh, President Biden's nominee, who is now on track to be confirmed with bipartisan support. That partisanship is part of what we heard some of the Republican senators push back against in statements today. Senator Mitt Romney, in a statement about his support of Judge Jackson, noted, quote, while I do not expect to agree with every decision she may make on the court, I believe that she more than meets the standard of excellence and integrity, unquote. Senator Murkowski noted what she called the corrosive politicization of the review process for Supreme Court nominees. So they seem to have wasted no time in coming out against the mainstream of their party in terms of the way that this process has been handled. And Lisa Murkowski, as well as Mitt Romney and Susan Collins, take a narrow view of the Senate's advice and consent role. They don't expect, as they made very clear in their statements, to uh, only vote for judges who are likely to rule uh, you know, the way they would like them to in every case. They believe that the president has broad discretion to choose a nominee, and as long as they're qualified, as long as they have a record of independence and are in the mainstream, they should be voted for. But that is not the view of the vast majority of Republicans here. And that, again, indicates how far the process has moved 
from where it was several decades ago. A lot of Republicans criticized Jackson's judicial philosophy, and by that they meant they wanted her to outwardly endorse the, the uh, philosophy of originalism and textualism. These are popular in conservative circles. They mean interpreting the Constitution narrowly and, and very strictly according to the, uh, the intent and the words that were written at the time it was written. Democrats have also played a part in uh, this politicization. A number of them have voted over uh, the last several decades against conservative justices who whose qualifications they didn't necessarily doubt, but who they thought were too rigorous, were too strict, too narrow in their interpretation of the Constitution, did not, were not willing to apply it to modern day circumstances that the framers could not possibly have envisioned. So there we see uh, the evolving confirmation process over the last many years and decades playing out now. So before I let you go, Sahil, just walk us through what happens from here. You said that Judge Jackson is pretty much on a glide path to confirmation with the Democratic senators supporting her and these three Republican senators supporting her. Any other political moves or opportunities to throw a monkey wrench in the process that we should keep an eye out for? Or does it pretty much look like smooth sailing from here? It pretty much looks like smooth sailing from here. What needs to happen is Senator Chuck Schumer files a, a cloture on the nomination, then there's an intervening day, and then there's 30 hours of debate evenly split between the parties. Democrats could yield at all, let Republicans burn those 15 hours. That's about all that Republicans can do at this point, lacking a majority vote to stop her. They can use those 15 hours, then the Senate will, will vote. Uh, once it votes to cut off debate, there will be a final vote shortly after. Again, all of this is at a majority threshold. There's no filibuster on Supreme Supreme Court nominations anymore. That 53 uh, vote in support that we saw for Jackson today is likely to be the, the vote, the same uh, tally every step of the way in the number of procedural motions coming up before there will be a final vote to make Judge Jackson Justice Jackson. And she will take office on the Supreme Court later this summer after Justice uh, Stephen Breyer steps down at the end of the Supreme Court's term, likely to be at the end of June, Joshua. Thank you, Sahil. Much appreciated. That's NBC National Senior Political Reporter Sahil Kapoor on Capitol Hill. Let's continue now with Julia Breyer, a former law clerk to Judge Jackson. Ms. Breyer, welcome. Good to have you with us. Thanks for having me, Joshua. What did you make of these hearings, particularly the way that they proceeded today in light of the questioning that Judge Jackson endured not too long ago? Yeah, I think in, in the hearings in total, Judge Jackson has demonstrated such depth and breadth of her qualifications. She has answered before today's vote more than 20 hours of questions. She submitted more than 1,500 separate written responses to the committee. Um, she offered every senator the opportunity to meet in person. She has established that she is more than qualified and deserving for this confirmation. So the committee's vote today along straight party line um, is is disappointing. Yeah, I, I did want to get your sense of what that tells you in terms of her uh, uh, recommendation not being discharged. First time in 169 years that that has happened. Quinnipiac University has done polling on Judge, on Judge Jackson. 51% said they support her confirmation, 30% oppose it. It's come up in the last few days as to whether or not this process should even be on camera, whether it should, should proceed the way that, that it does. She talked a lot about the, the trust that we put in the judiciary and the trust we put in our, our court system. How do you think all of this impacts that, especially if she does get confirmed? Well, you know, I think I would add to the numbers that you just showed on the screen that there are surveys going around showing that there's more support for Judge Jackson's confirmation um, something around 60%. That's the highest that it's been since the nomination of Justice Roberts. The people of this country believe that she should be confirmed. Um, so if anything, I think this country understands that what the committee did today was just partisan politics and that the judge is deserving and able to be and deserves to be uh, Justice Jackson. So I, I think if anything, moving her on and confirming her vote by the full Senate um, will will uphold the integrity of the Supreme Court and of the processes. We heard quite a bit from some members of the Senate, including the Judiciary Committee and some of the Republicans who, who say that they will support Judge Jackson about the process. Here is part of what Democratic Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut said about this process. Watch. If we treat the Supreme Court 
like another political branch, it will become one. It is a self-fulfilling prophecy, and right now we are fulfilling it. The United States Congress, and most especially my Republican colleagues, are fulfilling that prophecy by engaging in a party-line vote against a nominee that is superbly qualified. The court has many self-inflicted wounds, but the partisan combat we're seeing today is a wound that the United States Congress inflicts on the court. We also heard from Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski of Alaska, who announced today that she would be supporting Judge Jackson's nomination. In part, her statement reads, quote, it, meaning her support, it also rests on my rejection of the corrosive politicization of the review process for Supreme Court nominees, which on both sides of the aisle is growing worse and more detached from reality by the year, unquote. Julia Breyer, do you think this is behind Judge Jackson now? So if she gets confirmed, she's on the Supreme Court, she doesn't have to deal with any of these people ever again. And she gets to serve a lifetime appointment away from all of this politics. You know, I think the politics will remain. Um, whatever seat becomes vacant next, the politics will return. The partisan politics aren't going anywhere. But if she is confirmed and just Judge Jackson becomes Justice Jackson, she will do the same thing that she does and she has done for nearly a decade uh, on the lower courts. She will apply the facts to the case, um, every case at hand, and she won't be paying attention to the politics. She will be doing her job. You clerked for Judge Jackson. What was the most important thing that you learned from her, the most important thing that she taught you about jurisprudence and the law? Uh, I learned so much from Judge Jackson. She is brilliant. She is incredibly hardworking um, and so dedicated to the law and to this country, and she will be an exceptional, exceptional justice. Um, one thing that the judge taught me that has stayed with me in my career, because I clerked with her a decade ago nearly, um, is to reread out loud everything that I write before it's filed in court, uh, before it goes out the door, whatever it is. And Judge Jackson taught us to do that in order to make sure that the words that are on the page are something that everyone will understand because she understands that the work that she's doing in the courtroom is going to impact a lot of people. And she wants all of those people, both the parties before her um, and everyone else in the country, to understand her reasoning. And part of that is all about the transparency in the process that she so believes in. I certainly agree with her on reading your work out loud before you inflict it on the public. I think that in some lines of business, we need to do that more than we currently do. Before I have to let you go, Julia, I wonder what you would like to see done in terms of the partisanship that is infecting this process as you see it. I don't know if you have any ideas or, or suggestions or you just want the problem fixed, but what do you think might make a difference? You know, it is, I think, inherent in what our culture looks like right now with an emphasis on likes and tweets and attention. Um, but you have to balance that with the need for all processes to be transparent. I don't know what else we can do other than as, as voting members, um, people who are electing our senators, electing the people who are on the Senate Judiciary Committee who are involved in this process, um, but to, to vote in order to make that change happen. Julia Breyer, I appreciate you making time for us tonight. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Before we go, we'll get to some of today's other top stories, including an update on that deadly shooting in Sacramento. Plus, more than 3,000 flights were canceled across the U.S. this weekend. We'll tell you why. And tonight, Kansas plays UNC for the men's NCAA championship. Before we go, some of today's other big stories, starting with that deadly mass shooting in Sacramento. The city's mayor is calling it a senseless tragedy. Sacramento police say they have a suspect in custody, but investigators say they are still looking for more suspects. Here's NBC's Jay Gray. A day after six people were killed, 12 others injured in a massacre in downtown Sacramento, police now say they've arrested a suspect in that killing spree. 26-year-old Dandre Martin has been charged with assault 
and illegal firearm possession. It is really important to me that we do this right and get justice for those families. Investigators say they've recovered hundreds of pieces of evidence from the scene, including a stolen handgun. And officers continue to review social media posts from witnesses, including this video of a fight just before the deadly massacre. It's still not clear if the two incidents are related, as police continue to search for multiple suspects. Because this was senseless. This wasn't no one shot. If you was down there and you see all them bullets everywhere, I mean, that was a massacre. While this community struggles in the wake of a senseless tragedy. Jay Gray, NBC News. This was a nightmare weekend for air travel, especially if you were flying in or out of Florida. Thousands of flights were either canceled or delayed, mostly because of bad weather. The disruptions hit Florida particularly hard because it is the peak of spring break. Cancellations and delays also hit cities like Boston, New York, and Baltimore. Technology issues led to problems there. This is happening not only during spring break, but also as air travel is surging. Clearly, we've been cooped up too long during the pandemic, and we're eager to get around. Well, TSA says it screened more than 2 million travelers on Friday. And that puts us back at traffic levels from the 2021 Thanksgiving holiday. Women's college basketball has a new champion. Last night, the South Carolina Gamecocks beat the Huskies of UConn. It is the team's second NCAA championship ever. Today, South Carolina's coach Don Staley spoke on campus at a celebration for the champs. To our leadership, to President Pastides, to our, to our boss man, Ray Tanner, for putting women on a pedestal and treating us like the sport that we are, and in return, in return, we all gather here because of what? Because we want a damn national championship. The men's championship is tonight in New Orleans. The Kansas Jayhawks play the North Carolina Tar Heels. NBC's Morgan Chesky is outside the Superdome in New Orleans with more. Hey, Morgan. New Orleans before the men's national championship game. The Kansas Jayhawks taking on the UNC Tar Heels. March Madness coming to a close after an incredible last few weeks of games here. Fans already pouring into the Superdome behind me to take on the game that'll happen at 820 local time. Kansas, a number one seed uh, playing the Tar Heels, a number eight seed coming off uh, an incredible weekend where Kansas defeated Villanova uh, and the UNC Tar Heels outlasted our tribal Duke, uh, beating the Blue Devils in a game that went down to the absolute wire and sent legendary coach Mike Krzyzewski home uh, in his final game before retirement. As of right now, the Jayhawks remain about four point favorites, but as we all know, when it comes to March Madness, all bets are off. Uh, as it stands right now, if UNC wins tonight, it would be their school's seventh national title. Kansas would make it their fourth. Uh, and really, uh, when you look at the makeup of fans that are pouring in right now, what is so striking is that some of them who have had their teams lose over the last several days have now either hopped on the Jayhawk or the UNC bandwagon, all part of an incredible March Madness atmosphere here in New Orleans uh, that will culminate in tonight's men's championship. We'll send it back to you. We'd love to hear your story of negotiating the terms of your job, pay, benefits, time off, remote work. What worked for you? What do you wish you'd done differently? And what questions do you have about advocating for yourself? Share your stories and questions with us. We're at NBC Now tonight on social media. Leave us a voicemail or shoot us an email. Until we meet again, I'm Joshua Johnson. Thanks for making time for us. We'll see you tomorrow. Good night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.